group of people who have agreed to uh, talk with you this morning about their experiences in various areas. And this is probably going to be the liveliest part of the program today. Uh, so let me start with uh, introducing you, uh, and it's going to be to my right. Uh, first is Chairwoman Karen Diver. Uh, she is Chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, <laughs> yes. Auspicious. I, I saw her photograph next to President Obama, and it was it the second? Uh, the first. Yeah. The first one, uh, right there in the White House, and I thought, yes! <laughs> <laughs> An Indian woman who was chairwoman of her tribe, right there with the president. Um, she also serves as vice president of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, MCT, and is chair of the MCT Finance Corporation. Previously, she served for three years as the director of special projects for the uh, Fond du Lac Band and for 11 years as the executive director of the YWCA of Duluth. She was a founder of the American Indian Supportive Housing Initiative, and she represents area tribes on the Indian Health Service Tribal Self-Governance Committee. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Minnesota Duluth and a master's degree in finance, I'm sorry, in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She was a 2002 Bush Foundation Fellow, a leadership fellow. So maybe once again, <laughs> welcome Chairwoman Karen Diver. Bill Ziegler is president and CEA of Little Earth of United Tribes. Bill Ziegler came to the city from Lower Brule and started work for Little Earth in 2004. Since that time, he has put programs into place that are meant to assist in the growth and development of our children, young teens, families, and the overall community. These programs consist of education for children, early learning programs, mentoring services, tutoring, cultural activities, empowerment for parents, assistance with food and housing, and more. Little Earth now consists of partnerships and businesses such as the Little Earth Housing Corporation, the Little Earth Residents Association, and the Neighborhood Early Learning Center. Bill was instrumental in creating a 10-year capacity building and program development initiative with the goal to increase parental involvement in children's education, preschool enrollment rates, the high school graduation rate, the employment rate, community and community safety, resident involvement, home ownership, and earned income. Wow. <laughs> uh, next we have Suzanne Keplinger. She is executive director of the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. Um, she has an MA and has been the executive director of the Minnesota Indian Resource Center since December 2003. Now, we were talking just before <laughs> the uh, uh, program started, and the rest of what I have is incorrect. So, Suzanne, do you mind telling the audience the rest of your <laughs> little bio? <laughs> I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> we know this. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you do? You're on the Minneapolis Foundation Board. Yes, I'm a newly on the board of the Minneapolis Foundation. I serve on the grant making committee for the Women's Foundation's uh, Girls Are Not For Sale campaign, uh, steering committee for the Sheila Wellstone Institute. I'm on the board of the American Indian Community Development Corporation and an organization called Artspace. And, uh, bunch of other stuff. Badote. Badote. Oh, Badote. Actually, Heather is now serving on the board because yes. I have time. <laughs> so, but the organization is involved with a lot of partnerships and a lot of coalitions, and we, we work with a lot of various partners uh, on many of our initiatives. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, 
And at the end of the table, we have an enterprising young woman, uh, Rihanna Yazi, who is founder of the New Native Theater. Rihanna Yazi is a Navajo playwright and author of audio theater based in Minnesota. She is a two-time Playwright Center Jerome Fellow for 2010, 2011, and 2006, 2007, and is a Playwright Center core member. She founded New Native Theater as a nonprofit organization in 2009. New Native Theater, uh, NNT, is an organization dedicated to producing theater and theatrical events by and for Native audiences and the broader community. It is, like its name suggests, a new way of looking at, thinking about, and staging Native American stories. It is the first Native American organization of its kind to emerge in Minnesota with ambitions to become a professional theater. During the three years NNT has been in operation, it has greatly progressed the quality and quantity of Native theater experiences in Minnesota. NNT is successfully invigorating the Native community and engaging non-Native communities through play production, actor training, audience development, and the establishment of the first permanent home for Native theater in Minnesota. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> and just as an aside, uh, Rihanna and I were also co-hosts uh, for the uh, First Nations uh, Radio, which is now First Person Radio. And uh, so she knows her way around a radio <laughs> studio. <laughs> well, that's our panel. And uh, what we have in mind is that we're going to talk about the experiences, knowledge, and what these uh, different uh, ways of looking at uh, nonprofit work have to offer. Uh, there's a lot of experience here, and we wanted to be sure that we had uh, folks that had, uh, you know, that, uh, that chart that Jane showed you with the 10, 20, 30, uh, 40 years of experience. Because um, when they started uh, in the 1970s, uh, going into the 80s and 90s, um, it, it, there were different times economically. They had different hills to climb. And so their experiences come out of that, and uh, there's, there's a lot of wisdom also that comes out of that. So we're going to uh, just sort of have a conversation among ourselves and share with the audience, and then we're going to invite the audience to ask questions. Um, what, and not just ask questions, but tell us some of your own experiences that can add to uh, the flavor of the discussion. Um, th this report by the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits uh, is the first one in the American Indian arena. In future years, we're hoping to have uh, more of these um, because the uh, American Indian sector as a, non, as a part of the nonprofit sector is growing, is very important, and has made uh, great, uh, had an impact on Minnesota. Even though we were before the meeting, uh, we were talking about how much funding goes to Indians, and it's under 3% yes. uh, from the Council on Foundations, uh, what they had to say. It's shocking. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we, we have a vibrant uh, sector, and we have a, a lot of accomplishments under our belt. So, so the first area we're going to just kind of talk about is organization and resources. So w what is your experience in terms of your organization and the resources that you've been able to gather? And that's, you know, the, the half full side and the half empty side. So there certainly were disappointments along the way and, and uh, times when you tried something and, you know, Bill, for example, in that 10 year vision when you couldn't fill the cup all the way. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that, that I 
I try to do whenever we're looking at putting uh, programs together in a community is not to be driven or not to be led by what the foundation wants. No, that's a little counterintuitive. I, I get that. Uh, foundations, they have their uh, things that they pay attention to and that's what they want to fund. Um, I made a point, frankly, to say we have the answers for our community. We know what's best for ourselves as Indian people. Here's what the answer is to whatever the issue we're facing. Um, when we set out on this 10-year vision, I realized that I came into Lidler that it was a very different time. And I came fresh off a reservation in South Dakota, and I had no clue what it meant to, to be in a city or live in a city. I had tell I'd never been to a city in my life before I took this job here. And I came into a, a time and place where uh, the drugs and the chaos and the crime was, was uh, at epidemic proportion, frankly. And so I came in, and kind of the, how the 10-year the plan emerged was the first thing we, that we had to do within our community is to find uh, a solid footing. You know, how do we stabilize our community? And I knew coming in that I didn't have the, uh, that's sort of the skill set or the answers to do that, uh, but I had a belief in the community and belief in Indian people that, that we deserve better as a community. So I went out into Little Earth. I went out and talked to the people. Uh, and it was the residents themselves who set that, that, that foundation down. As the residents themselves said, okay, we can't live this way anymore. We're tired of burying our, our kids. Uh, so the residents changed an expectation within the community on what, was, uh, what would constitute acceptable behavior. Once that happened, when we had some semblance of stability where we weren't just continually putting on fires, uh, we knew that the next step uh, was vision. We had to have a vision uh, as a community. Uh, if, if, we're, if we would continue to just aimlessly walk around, if you will, we'd get nowhere. And that's, that happened for too many years at Little Earth. So we went, set about creating a vision for the community. And it was a vision that emerged not from me or our board or for anybody else, frankly. That vision came from Little Earth. It came from the people. And it was bold, and it was, uh, I think it, it showed all the things that are good about Indian people and all the values that we hold as Indian people. It was on display in 2005 at that time during the, these planning sessions. Uh, so, and they're simple. One of the, the vision statements that came out was expect education, right? Simple, right? But if you think about it, as Indian communities, hell, we don't expect education. Uh, the, the achievement gap proves that, the, the, the dropout rate, rate proves that we hadn't truly expected education within our communities. So the residents at Little Earth, they set out a bold vision and say, here's, a, here's where we see ourselves in 10 years. So then this, the, the 10 year plan was taking the community's vision and it was staff and, and uh, the board members, and our board is a blend of community members and external professionals. It was taking the community's vision and drawing that roadmap. Okay, we knew where we were today. Right? We knew our starting point. We knew the vision. We knew where the community wanted to be. So it was our task then to, to put together this 10 year plan on how we would achieve the people's vision. Um, it's been a journey. It absolutely has. Uh, some of the things that the community um, was visioning and dreaming of, frankly, in 2005 seemed out of, they weren't real. There's no way in hell that we would be able to build single family home ownership within our community. Guess what, y'all, we have five homes on the block now that families are um, transitioning into. The, so we've had, I think, tremendous success in, in reaching our goals with the staged approach we took in this vision. Um, I think the, the smartest thing we did, number one, was listening to the community, listening to the people, it was their vision. And the second thing was we understand relationship. It's a virtue in every native community. It's a cornerstone in everything that we are. It's relationship or relational people. And that's the, the, the approach that we took from a leadership standpoint is we're gonna develop relationships, uh, whether it be with our own community or with funders. And I see a ton of funders here uh, in the room and, and we've had the conversations and they've all heard me curse and I probably shouldn't be doing that, but, um, you know, but it's building that relationship with people uh, and, and helping them understand and helping them see that vision and, and helping the fund foundation role get excited about that vision that we have within our community. So we've been successful there. The kind of the, the half empty side of that is, uh, it really comes down to a capacity issue. We have so many things that we need to do within our communities and, and we just don't have the full capacity to do them, um, but we just keep working, so. That's a good, that's a good answer. And, and Chairwoman uh, Diver, 
uh, when you were elected and you became the chairwoman of your tribe, you moved into a very different arena. Uh, what's that been like at, uh, at Fond du Lac? It's amazing how much it kind of mirrors your work over at Little Earth in terms of, you know, where are we now? Um, what does the community want? We undertook a fairly comprehensive um, membership-wide um, strategic planning effort. Even our off-reservation enrollees were able to have input, and we set forth, um, they set forth goals for tribal government to actually focus on two areas. One, promoting personal responsibility and self-sufficiency, and two, access to and promoting language and culture. Um, you know, in the implementation of all of that, half of my enrollees do not live on the Fond du Lac Reservation. Half live on or near, half are spread out all over. Um, we were also heavily recruited into the relocation program, so we have uh, many tribal members who live in the Twin Cities, they live in Chicago, they live all over the world. Um, and the challenge for us as a kind of a, a home rule community, we have a land base, the Fond du Lac Reservation, that's our homeland, and our primary responsibility has to build service delivery there. It's fairly rural. Um, closest town is Duluth. We have a lot of um, our tribal members living there. They have access to us through our urban services in Duluth and they're able to, to come back to the home community. And we do have regular meetings down here in the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe Embassy Building right down the street. Um, the members of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe have urban offices here and, and we'll refer to an awful lot of you folks um, to meet the needs here. Um, to talk a little bit about cup half full, cup half empty, now I'm on the other side of the coin going from a nonprofit um, serving a largely Native um, American community in Duluth to now the tribal chair and I feel all these little fingers trying to come into the tribal coffers. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, the access to tribal resources. Um, gaming is new to tribes. We've only been doing it since the late 80s. Um, we have 250 years of trauma to overcome in our own communities. Um, gaming is a surrogate tax base. It is not unlimited wealth. Um, I mind a budget just like all of you guys every year. I project revenue and I need to live within it. Um, I don't have the ability from the home community to recreate all of the services off-site in all of the places my tribal members are. Um, and for tribal serving nonprofits, um, they, it's almost like people want to always say, well, you need to serve your own community wherever they are. Well, guess what? They're your citizens too. And you don't get to abdicate your responsibility to your citizens based on race. And you also can't rely on us to be the sole funder of your operations because as community-based nonprofits, you need to, to raise your own funds and implement your own mission and develop your own leadership. Because guess what? If we're gonna pay from it from the tribe, we're kind of funny about it. If we pay for it, we wanna run it. People ran our crap for years and did a really bad job at it. <laughs> right? Um, so we're kind of funny about our own self-governance and self-determination. Do you know what I mean? Tribal communities had, had been done for for years by the federal government, like I said, fairly poorly. Um, so we get ownership issues. You know, If we're going to be over half your budget, then we want to have tribal employ, uh, employment rights ordinance apply um, and have tribal preference in hiring. We want it folded into our strategic plan and our goals. Um, you know, we demand some level of, you know, cultural competency and, and meeting our, our own community goals. So, um, you know, it's, I remember dealing with some philanthropic requests and I actually started making p people fill out a form. And they actually, I asked them, do you, how many Native Americans do you serve? How many of those are Fond du Lac band members? Because funnily <laughs> enough, not all Indians are my Indians. There are 11 tribes in Minnesota. Um, this is a service hub for the relocation program. They come from all over the country. I also am accountable to my tribal membership. My citizens will ask me, how are we using our resources? And they're okay with serving tribal communities in general, um, but not exclusively. But they're gonna wanna know they're a primary part of the population that's being served, and also that Fond du Lac band members themselves are utilizing those services. Um, it, it's kind of like we don't expect Wisconsin to throw money over here for any of their residents that might move to Minnesota, right? 
we don't go say you're from Wisconsin, you need to find some money from those people in Wisconsin. So kind of the misunderstanding of people of, of tribal communities is not being pan-Indian, we are from different nations, um, you know, and then also their, their dual citizenship. They, although they are members of tribes, they don't abdicate their citizenship in the community they reside with at the moment. Um, but we do need to have those partnerships, and Fond du Lac has tried to figure out ways to meet some of the gaps in service delivery that might be available. For example, um, many of you may or may not know that you know one of the big gaps in the Twin Cities was healthcare services. Um, we have two um, Native American primary serving clinics, but there was no pharmacy. Um, so we came in and we've been self-delivering pharmacy services. We like to call it the only pharmacy in the state that doesn't have a cash register. Um, you know, any member of any enrolled tribe in Hennepin um, and Ramsey County can come there and receive their, their pharmaceuticals for free um, under our IHS delivered services, Indian Health Services. Um, so, you know, we're doing what we can um, to help build capacity, um, but also within what is a priority for us, serving tribal people and our home community members. We're making referrals um, and trying to connect, to have those connections. The hardest part for me is I don't ever want to see a tribal member who has built a sense of community here, a sense of family, and a network where they'll feel comfortable, comfortable, comfortable excuse me. I don't want them to ever think that they have to come home to get what they need. So the, the health of the sector is important to us too because people are most successful when they have that circle of support around them and I don't want them to have to leave because they need health care, because they can't find housing services, because they, you know, the whole litany of needs tribal community members may have as they live in the urban area. They should also get to choose where they live and be successful without saying go back where you came from to get what you need. So little bit from a tribal perspective I've seen it from both sides of the coin mm -hmm. um, the balance is always going to be tough because I could actually um, start five more businesses and still not meet the needs in the home community so that tension between meeting people where they're at as well as assuring the health of the home community is something that I'm sure every tribal leader deals with on a daily basis mm. and and yet we have this need to be joyful the need to have theater and creativity. And Rihanna Yazi, tell us the story of how, um, we, want to, we want to know about resources, and I know that's something that you struggle with, but tell us the story of how you came to be in Minneapolis with this wonderful, wonderful new Native theater. Yes. Um, I, um, I, I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, I always loved performing. I always loved theater, and um, there, there. I think there are a lot of factors uh, for Native people when they're interested in going into the arts, and I think it's, um, arts that aren't necessarily uh, traditional arts, um, the arts that we every day consume and the stories we see every day that tell us who we are. As Native people, we don't have the luxury of accessing stories every day, every moment, to reflect back to us the story of who we are. And that's why I think it's so important to do arts in the contemporary sense, um, while being informed with traditional arts and culture. Um, so my, my path to this um, was, I, you know, I always wanted to do performing arts, and uh, being, a, being a Native person, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'll generalize, but I was very shy, I was very shy, and so instead of um, being an actor or something like that, I ended up being a playwright, and because I, I could do it without people criticizing me uh, <laughs> or, or looking at me. And um, so I studied playwriting, and I went to the University of Southern California um, and uh, started to get myself going there. And then I found this organization, the Playwright Center, right here on Franklin Avenue. Um, and I got a fellowship to be a playwright full time in Minneapolis. And so I thought, oh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, there's so many Native people there. And, 
Minneapolis is where it's happening for urban natives. <laughs> so, and there's so many theater companies here. There's 100 theater companies. And I thought, well, that's the perfect place to be a native theater person. So, so I, I come here and expecting to see arts galore, native people doing theater. And there wasn't anything. And the and you know, going to the Playwright Center, I would develop plays. I couldn't get native actors to be in my plays. Um, imagine if August Wilson couldn't get black actors in his plays. Could he have ever developed his work, his voice in that way? Uh, that's why I started to look um, beyond myself and and so naturally this, this idea of creating a theater company started to happen because I saw so many creative native people in the community um, who, you know, from, from my experience and my lens, they were all actors and performers, but they just weren't doing it. They were sort of hidden away and doing social service jobs and, um, which is wonderful. <laughs> but the thing is, is that um, arts is a social service. Arts, arts is the way that we learn about who we are. And if we as Native people don't have those images to inform us, um, it, it makes it that much harder, I think, for the social service um, sector to, to reach us. Because you need, you need that marriage of, of the two. Um, because if 99% of any image you've ever seen about Native people was created by a non-Native mind, and you're a young Native child growing up in this environment, how are you supposed to figure out who you are, and then you're supposed to weed away colonial thought with traditional thought, and the thing that helps every other person in our country and in the world figure out who they are is they have a very strong community of artists who reflect back our own stories and tell us who we are. So that's why I do theater. And, and so doing theater, just coming down to the practical end of it, being in Minneapolis, um, I, need, I needed lots of people to help because it's a collaborative art form. So um, I, I started off with um, going to places where Native people performed, like uh, karaoke at the Wolves Den. And, <laughs> and, I, and I, I found quite a few actors there. And, and <laughs> we, we, have this, we have this great video on our Facebook page of somebody who I, I met singing ACDC's Great Balls. And I thought, if she wasn't an actor, Nobody was. Um, so the thing, the next step was you find these wonderfully, these wonderful uh, diamonds in the rough, but they need, they need the training and the experience. And the reason they didn't go into theater in the first place to learn was because of that cultural barrier. And the fact that performing arts is something you just have to put yourself out there. And so it, it's a double layer of um, you know, coming, coming from a culture that values humility and humbleness, and then um, at the same time being thrown into the epitome of Western culture, which is individualism and look at me. And, and you're supposed to, as a Native person, find your way through that and become a theater artist and then tell our stories as Native people. It's kind of tough. So, so I started this um, actor ensemble. It's an all-Native actor ensemble. And so in that, there was safety and security for people to begin to express themselves. And so we've been doing this for three years. And uh, we j just culminated uh, so far. In November, we did a musical. Uh, completely native musical, brand new songs, um, book, and actors. And um, it was called 2012 The Musical. And um, there was a lot of humor in it because when we as native people tell our own stories, we authentically present ourselves. And so that means there's gonna be a lot of humor, which is the best kept secret in the native community. Um, 
people outside of our community don't know how funny we are and don't know how funny we think we are. <laughs> so, um, so, this, so this play, as it evolved, we, you know, looking at it, we're thinking, well, it's super important for me to be telling stories that reflect back the experience of us as Native people. And if, people, and if folks who aren't Native um, or don't have the experience of being around Native people, if they come to the play, that's great. But what I really need to do is strengthen that nervous system inside our own community. And when you strengthen the nervous system, you strengthen it by seeing positive images of yourself. You see it by things being reflected back to you. And um, so we had this, this, great, this great musical. We wrote, we wrote a song called Franklin Avenue. Um, and uh, we had characters all, all throughout the community in the play. Um, the character I played was a grant writer, and, um, <laughs> and she fell in love with an AIM patrol member, or, um, well, it wasn't AIM, it was ARM. That's a whole other story why I had to censor that. But, <laughs> um, so, you know, we, and I, would, I thought that it would be easy to find funding to do this. Uh, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. Um, what we have been successful at is um, we, we have gotten government grants, and that's been the thing that's been consistent for us. Um, it's been difficult to get grants from the private sector and from um, family foundations. Um, and so, and, and right now, uh, we, we're, still, we're still in the process of getting that 501c3. And so, um, uh, other foundations we haven't quite been able to get, uh, to get funding from yet. But um, I, th I think the thing is, is that um, with Native theater, I, I really do, it's my job to spread the gospel of Native theater, <laughs> tell you why it's so important and why it's, it's important to have healthy and strong artists within the Native community who are, who are there to tell us what our stories are. And um, I think that's... Well, I, I just would add to that that my uh, daughter is a choreographer mm -hmm. <clears throat> and a big fan of Rihanna. And she confronts the exact same question uh, in modern dance and how does that fit into the uh, uh, umbrella of culture in the American Indian community. You know, and I mean, one other thing is um, some Native funders don't fund this sort of performing arts. And um, I was excited to look at the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. The, the grant had, the call for grants or fellowships had just come out again. I'm like, yes, look at it. We will not fund playwriting or theater at this time. A little bit of a letdown, but um, but that's such an important thing because it's telling stories it, in a way that we normally consume stories, and 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 it's I think it's just so important to to recognize that. Yeah. Oh. It, well, and Suzanne Kaplinger, you know, your organization is seasoned; it has been there; it is enormously successful, and yet. You've got the situation with a half empty. Can, can you tell us about that? Sure, thank you. Uh, the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, we're gonna turn 30 next year. Um, I've been there about 10 years now. And we have, um, we get about 45% of our funding from government contracts. Those are state and county contracts. And they've been very consistent over the 10 years that I've been there. And another very consistent theme is that we have not gotten a cost of living increase in most of those contracts in the 10 years I've been there. My staff continues to get raises and we continue to pro provide benefits, but we don't get cost of living increases in our government contracts. That's a problem. We also have uh, a lot of United Way money. We have a contract with the Public Housing Authority for our Section 8 units. We have a partnership with the Fond du Lac Band for our treatment program for Native women with co-occurring disorders. We have a partnership with Cummins Power Generations. So we have a corporate partnership. So what we've done is really try to expand our partnerships uh, and then I have to fundraise a whole bunch of money every year from foundations, individuals, and uh, smaller corporate donors. And along with um, what Bill was saying, we don't want to create programs to meet the guidelines of the funders. And 
The way I frame it is that we will not be seduced by the RFP. It's, I mean, it's easy because, yeah, thank you, because <laughs> this pot of money appears and it's like, oh man, we could do that and there's a need for that, but is it within our mission? Is it within our capacity? Is it stretching too far? What about our operational functions? Are we solid? Do we have good, strong organizational core, which I call or organizational Pilates? So we had to really focus on our core, our administrative team, our billing processes, our finance, our governance, our board, and really look at how we were doing that before we could stretch out and take on new opportunities. So uh, a couple, just a couple things about uh, resources. We are pretty creative and we are pretty nimble and we are able to take advantage of opportunities as they arise to a good extent. I mean, we weathered the economic downturn of 08 through 10. Nobody, uh, we didn't freeze salaries. My staff got at least a 2% salary through all of that. Uh, I did have to lay off some staff in our child care program during that time because, so we're a little over a $3 million organization and I have one program that loses almost a half a million dollars every year. That's Cherish the Children Early Learning Center, accredited, four-star rated, infant through preschool, absolutely critical. Every year the board and I discuss this. It is absolutely vital to our mission that we provide this service for our children. And yet, the state reimbursement rate has been frozen since 2001, essentially. Uh, we got another cut last year. And my costs go up. So it's a, it's a business model. We look at it as a business model. So I fundraise that every year. Uh, with accreditation and four-star rating, we've, we've got an additional revenue coming in. But it's a structural problem. Complicating that are sort of the environmental shifts with some of the big foundations in the last few years. It's, it, it's difficult to keep up uh, when the you know, Bush Foundation, McKnight Foundation are, are shifting their priorities. You know, we understand that it's not our decision what they're gonna fund, but it's very destabilizing when several of them are shifting at one time. So we, we know we have to get smarter about diversifying our revenue and looking at fee-for-service revenue and earned income revenue and trying to build um, a more sustainable and diverse revenue stream for the organization, and that's what we're focusing on right now. We think about it in terms of where, where is our stance, where is our organizational stance. If we're at a 50-50 stance, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, we're, we're standing up tall. We can kind of see what's going on around us. Not too easy to push us over. If we're at a 40-60 stance, we're, whoa, we're trying to get caught up on everything, we don't have time, we don't have resources, we're reacting to everything. If we're in a 60-40 stance, we're slightly forward, we're much more nimble, we're much more able to move quickly when opportunities present, ourselves, present themselves. So we're trying to get more organizationally into a 60-40 stance. Part of the challenge around that is the requirements on the nonprofit sector to to do all the due diligence that we need to do to be accountable for the resources. We have to be accountable. And that requires a strong financial team, human resource administrative services, it requires a maintenance, you know, receptionist. There's an administrative function that nobody wants to pay for. Uh, and yet there's a whole lot of requirements of what we need to do. So last year we were able to work with our corporate partners and get a three-year grant to hire a director of operations which is helping us now explore how do we get a new data system that will help us accurately capture the data more effectively. We have to move to uh, electronic medical billing system by 2014. We need to integrate those systems. How do we upgrade our website to do more social media fundraising and more web-based fundraising? Uh, how do we market the organization to potential individual donors, large gift donors? So we're really working on some of those tools right now with the director of operations on board. We have been able to, you know, in fact, do things like risk analysis. Emergency preparedness, you know, the, the sorts of organizational strengthening things that we all need to do, but there's so few time and resources to actually get that work done. We do have that opportunity to do it now, but it's a three-year grant, and if we don't have new revenue streams securely in place by the end of the three years, the position goes away. And I'm hoping that that's not gonna happen because ideally, from an organizational planning standpoint, keeping that position in, intact within our structure is very, very important to our strength, our core strength as an organization. Once we have that core strength in place, we are able to look at where can we partner more effectively with other organizations who are doing the work. We shouldn't do everything. And I got a couple of board members in the room and they'll, they'll back me up on this. We can't do everything. But who's doing the work that needs to be done that we can partner with 
and find out where that opportunity is for us to get a grant that we share or that they get the grant and we just provide some training or some referrals or whatever that is, so that we begin to look for those opportunities to say, other organizations are doing very important work and we need to find those resources for all of us to deepen the work that we can do in the community together. So that's a bit about Well, us. Suzanne, uh, as long as I have you on the line, <laughs> uh, we're gonna move to the next section, which is leadership and governance. What's your opinion, it, not necessarily just your organization, <clears throat> of the value of leadership and governance? What does it bring to the organization? Loaded question. It's, it, there's no <laughs> way to, uh, I don't think there's any way to accurately capture how important it is to have American Indian women in leadership throughout the organization. So my board is a majority American Indian women, the officers are majority, majority American Indian women, my staff, et cetera. So one of the things that we're doing right now is really trying to build internal leadership. I've got great staff, I mean, I've got great staff. And there are some young Native women in there who are emerging leaders. So where, how can I provide those opportunities for them to build their leadership within the context of their day-to-day -day work? So we got a small grant from the Novo Foundation to do our organizational capacity building project which is uh, designed to provide leadership opportunities and professional and personal development opportunities for all staff. So, and they'd identify that. So if one person wants to create a PowerPoint presentation and, and apply to a conference to go do this presentation, we've got a little pot of money we can send her to that conference so she can begin to practice her presentation skills and her, present, uh, her public speaking skills. Somebody else wants to go to a healing conference uh, because they're doing a lot of uh, trauma work, a lot of direct trauma work, and many of my staff are survivors of lots of things, and so how do you make sure that staff are not being re-victimized by secondary trauma? Well, we need to make sure that we provide an environment that they are able to go to ceremony whenever they need to go, to get access to healers whenever they need that, to go to healing um, conferences that are on their reservations, their home reservations. So we've got a little pot of money to do that. It's really, really important. So building the leadership internally, and we also are trying to explore uh, what does a more shared leadership model look like? How do we flatten out that hierarchy into a more culturally congruent leadership framework? I mean, we operate within an environment that still says who's in charge, who signs the contracts, who's responsible. That's me. But within that context, there should be ways for us to flatten that out and make it a more circular leadership model. And so I have a leadership team we're really good at delegating, at saying, you know, I don't need to make that decision, you make that decision, or we'll make that decision together, or, or there's, you know, sort of four different levels of decision making that go on. But part of the internal leadership building that we're doing is finding out where the frontline staff can now come into that. And as part of our uh, strategic planning process, we identified things like recycling. I don't have to do that, but I got two staff who really want to take the lead on it. Great, go, do that. I don't have to be the one to do these things. So where is the opportunity for frontline staff to identify where they want to have the most impact, where they want to grow their own skill set, and then I need to be able to provide that for them uh, so that there's bench strength within the organization and that the future leadership of this community is being developed and supported. Great. And Chairwoman Diver, leadership and governance is very different in an elected government. You know, very much so. Um, you know, we've got uh, we have 2,200 employees. I manage around 55 departments. You know, we have for-profit um, subdivisions as well as government and service delivery, and then all the normal stuff you see in a government, public works, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So the job is awfully varied. You know, I economics major that spent time in the nonprofit sector. Um, you know, what do I know about anything? Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a bureaucrat. Um, so, but I, I've got some smart and great people um, running these departments. A lot of homegrown leadership um, and a lot of up and coming leadership. And one of the things we've been very good at um, at Fond du Lac and with the organizations we've worked for is to really say, um, you know, recognize that the career laddering needs to be there within the organization. Um, 
we have adhered so strictly to tribal employment rights ordinance that we promote it inappropriately. You know, just because you've been um, an entry level employee doesn't mean if you're there long enough that you're ready to be a supervisor. Um, so we've done a lot to really internalize a lot of our training functions. Um, we were a founder of the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. We have an excellent scholarship program. I do not ever want to be an organization where I see a bunch of non-natives in a supervisory role and a lot of worker bees from our own community. Um, that's not healthy. It needed to be that way for a while, um, but it doesn't need to be that way anymore. Um, whether it's promoting, you know, education and seeing our first Indian doctors come through the door and our nurse practitioners and our nurses and our, our public health community. We wouldn't have made the inroads within our own community if we were not a culturally competent organization. And unfortunately, you can have allies, um, you can have friends, you can have people that care, um, but to see a face that looks like yours or know who their grandma was um, matters. Um, the trust relationship, being able to step over all of those barriers quickly matters in terms of service delivery. So, um, you know, one of the things that um, University of Minnesota Duluth has been working on, is they now have a master's in tribal administration and government. And, you know, my, my little challenge back to them when they were thinking about this is, you know, it's really fun to think big thoughts around governance, um, but you need to bring it down to the practical level. I need people who are not only trained in their field, whether that's social work, early childhood, whether they're a cop, whatever they are, whatever their passion is for their work, we need to turn them into managers. Do they know how to manage people? Do they know how to manage a budget? Do they know how to set goals and implement them and have some vision long term? So more institutional capacity and people thinking about their own leadership and how to practically do it on a day-to-day -day basis. And you guys who are tribal members in here, you know this, we got tons of big talkers in Indian country. You know what I mean? We, we can talk, talk, talk all around everything, but can you do anything? You know, that's where the rubber meets the road and is an implementation, right? Um, and not the theory and not the ideas and um, you know so that's what's been a, a challenge for me is don't just talk about it how do we teach our people to do it you know and I think as we make inroads and as people get experiences you know both outside tribal communities and within um, you know we start to build a homegrown leadership the other part of it is is um, you know a, a, a bit of the you know, the practical part that we have to be comfortable with cultiva cultivating leadership. You know, we have this whole generation out there who were there and they're at the forefront and they fought the hard battles and, and you know, they got kind of happy where they were, you know, but we got new people coming up and they got new ideas how to do it. And um, so a part of it is really kind of um, owning, I think, um, our, our willingness to share that leadership and cultivate it, not be threatened by it. And you get these young, bright kids and, you know, they're, they're just ready to go. And you have to be ready to let it happen and accept what comes with it. And that means our older generation being somewhat adaptable um, and being willing to change and, and have bring them into the fold. So I see it in the nonprofit sector with young people, um, you know, coming in and they come back home with, you know, great ideas on how to contribute. and. It's just being ready for it. We've, we're resilient people. We've adapted. That's how come we're still here. Um, and in the home community, though, it's like, oh, well, they're coming from outside and bringing in these new ideas, you know? Aren't they just cute? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, a part of it is, I think, indulging their, indulging the learning curve and letting them learn, letting them make the mistakes, letting them try it, um, and, and celebrating their success. Well, and I think we see that um, statewide the uh, population is um, 60,000 plus, and then when you fold in uh, those who are Indian and something else, it goes up to 100,000. There's a lot of population, which means there's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of capacity for innovation. And that's our last piece that we're gonna talk about because I think it, um, it really leads to that because it is sort of a crossroads between um, next generation and innovation. Not all new ideas are good ideas, but the good ideas that get through um, have a uh, lot of convincing uh, to do uh, in, with foundations. And that's been one of the issues that we've had. Um, uh, as, as tribes and as nonprofit organizations is the 
seemingly separation by a common language. We're talking English, they're talking English, but it just seems to go zoom right past. Um, uh, Bill, you talked about that a little bit, and you talked about gathering the community together and saying, we're gonna have a five-year vision, this is what we're gonna do, uh, and, and you went down the road and you built housing for ownership, which was, I think, a dream of many people who were affiliated with uh, uh, Little Earth, but it didn't happen. What did you do to make that happen, that big, big innovation? Right. And, you know, I think there's a couple things that, that uh, uh, I potentially bring to the table. Uh, and number one, and folks who know me have heard me say this many times, number one, I'm, I'm not too smart. Uh, I'm, I'm really not. Um, and bec but because I'm not too smart, I don't know how to take no for an answer. <laughs> I just think, why can't we do this, right? Uh, yeah, maybe I'm just too naive to, to know better, but why can't we do this? Um, you know, the second thing I think I potentially bring to the table that, that helps at Little Earth is uh, uh, four little letters I'll share with each of you. Uh, those letters are A, D, H, D, right? <laughs> I don't quit. My mind never quits, and, and so I always have to have something to, to keep me motivated. Uh, this is, you're going to think this is weird, but there's some small part of me that really misses the good old days at Little Earth when I used to be able to chase drug dealers and gang members around. I don't get to do that anymore, so things are getting a little boring in the community. Um, but no, you know, what I think it is is it's really about... What I, brought, what I bring to the table primarily at Little Earth is uh, because I was raised in a, in a La Jota way, in a traditional way on my reservation, and, and I heard the stories from my, from my grandmother and my dad, and, and those stories were lessons about life. You know, in my mind as a kid, I didn't necessarily understand the story about Crazy Horse or a story about Sitting Bull or you, know, uh, you know, having to sit there and endure these stories. I'm thankful I had to do that because at my age now, it's applicable. Those stories were getting me ready for life and, and for leadership and uh, putting my heart and mind to, to the moins, but my heart and mind together uh, to be able to, I guess, have the courage uh, to make decisions and to the understanding of how to, to build a consensus within the community. Um, one of the things that, that, that I, I did immediately at Little Earth was I, I had to understand that I was coming in. I was 32 years old and I took the job. I was, was kind of young. Um, and there's all this amazing leadership within the Twin Cities. And I often say that I'll, I'll never forget uh, that I stand on the shoulders of giants in many ways. There's so many leaders from the past that I owe a debt of gratitude to uh, because, because of their leadership and their uh, a, a willingness to fight is, is why I'm able to do this work today. Um, but I, ca I came into the, the job with the belief that uh, two, two things. Number one, we have to Respect the past, be in the present, but always keep the door open to the future. And because that's a mentality that, that I had, and as a staff, we've been able to kind of, that's been our, our uh, organizational culture. And as a community, we've really adopted that, you know, as, as an or, uh, community culture. Um, and then the second thing, and this is to your point of why I think the, the home ownership uh, has been uh, successful uh, and why we've been able to drive crime in our community down by over 70 percent, uh, why we've seen our, our graduation rate go from less than 5 percent to upwards of, of 80 and 85 percent within a three-year period, because we understood in our community that as Native peoples, we didn't put ourselves here. Now, I'm not saying I'm from a land-based perspective, but uh, think about the, the things that we've had to endure as Native people, right? Uh, we, we had to endure uh, 1491, 1492. Uh, yeah, 1491 right here, so 1492. Um, 1492. Yep. Uh, we've had to endure uh, the, the boarding school era. We've had to endure the reservation system. We've had to endure all these things that were done to us as Native peoples, and that uh, put us at a certain, at a, at a certain place as Indian people. So I think at Littler, we understand that, that all those things were done to us, right? But none of those folks, whether it be the government or the churches or whomever, whatever institution or system has victimized, victimized us, they'll never make it right, right? So as Native people, we have to understand, that, okay, yes, that happened, 
Lord, we're going to refuse to continue to allow that to have power over us. We're going to stand up as Native people, and we're going to look towards that vision that we've created uh, as a community, and we're going to put in our work towards that vision. And that's what we've seen at Little Earth. And, uh, and it, it's put simply, it, it's no longer uh, allowing ourselves uh, it, uh, from a mind uh, or mental standpoint um, to continue to, per to perpetrate low expectations upon ourselves. Right? Think about this. It wasn't that long ago that as Native peoples, we never expected anything out of ourselves. So a lot of the work that we've done and the reason we've had the success is we have gone that philosophical route, right? But you've got to think you have to start or you have to start that vision. But where the rubber meets the road, you've got to be willing to do the work. And no, no one's going to do it for us. We want home ownership for our community, then we need to do that. Nobody's going to do that for us. Uh, we want to reduce crime in our community, then we need to do it. We need to hold our community accountable for behavior. So that's how we've been successful. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to um, open up to some questions. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions out there. And uh, Jane is going to help with, uh, with translation. <laughs> um, so far away. Bill, you were talking about um, some of the strides and some of the accomplishments at Little Earth. One of the things that um, I'm very concerned about, and I think all of us, no matter what our specific mission is, are about uh, trying to eliminate intergenerational poverty, long term. And in Minneapolis, we have a situation with our kids, and it's the same probably in Duluth and probably, I'm sure, in St. Paul other in reservation areas as well. But we have a situation where only 34% of Indian students attended school 95% or more of the time. And we're never going to affect or reduce intergenerational poverty until we can create a school-going culture in our community. So I would just like to hear ideas from the panel about how we might do that. Um. Do you, you want to go? go okay. Oh, so repeat the I, I have a, uh, one of my older sisters uh, dropped out of high school when she was a sophomore. She had five kids. Not one of her kids graduated high school. Oh. You're creating a school going culture. Uh, creating a school. The question was how do we collectively create a school going culture? Um, so my sister dropped out. She had five kids. Not, not one of her children graduated from high school. I, I grew up with, there's ten siblings in my family. And, and the only three of us graduated high school. Grew up in the exact same home, the exact same parents, same parenting, et cetera. But I'm looking at, at the decisions that, that my, some of my siblings made, and it, it's, it's applicable to Little Earth and to Indian, the Indian community, and, and really trying to understand, okay, why? Why are we so resistant as Indian people to the educational system? It's simple, look at historically. Education was used as a weapon of mass destruction against Native peoples. Education, the education system was used to, uh, with the theory of, of kill the Indian, save the man, right? So it's all that, that historical stuff persists today. So a lot of our families, uh, our young mothers may not understand why they, have no, they don't value education. They may not fully understand why they're not getting their kids up and getting them on that bus. It's all the historical stuff that I think we're carrying with us. So but the, the strategy that we've instituted at Little Earth, and it, it, it's proving to be successful and obviously we, we still have issues within our community and uh, we're always working on uh, things uh, but if we only focus on the child and, and that that child's educational journey will continue to fail we have to look at the entire family we have to look at the entire home and and if the if mom's in school if mom's uh taking college courses she's more apt to see the value in education and push education amongst her, her family another thing i think we have to figure out how to overcome and i think we overcome that again by making sure the parents are educated when i went off to college uh i was the first in my family and y'all have no idea how guilty i felt that i was in college 
my brothers were doing their thing and some were in federal prison and, and so why me? Why am I the lucky one? You know, I'm turning my back on my family, I'm turning my back on my people by, by doing this white man thing, right? That, that was my thought process. And a lot of our families still have that, kind of that, that hang up or that mentality, but by helping really push and educating the parents in the home, uh, it'll make it easier to educate the child. There's the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, but, um, but not all of the tribes participate in that equally, Part, partly because our noses are all out of joint because it's actually a state-formed board. You know, we tend to resist when they snap their fingers at us for anything. Um, no, we are 11 distinct tribes, and while it, it would be awfully convenient for other people to homogenize us out down to a single mission, it's just, it's just not gonna happen. Yep, that just means you're gonna have to do the hard work, get in the car and drive to all 11 to see if they want you to do it. Yeah. Uh, there was a little uh, experiment uh, just to build on that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, Migazi Communications um, engaged in, <clears throat> having to do with telecommunications and how uh, greater um, enhanced uh, telecommunications could help tribes that are in proximity to one another. And so um, as we were, uh, uh, Migazi did a uh, statewide conference and invited all 11 tribes and all 11 sent representatives. Um, and after uh, a while, perhaps a year or so, the economic development uh, group uh, f that it included Red Lake, um, I think uh, Leech Lake and White Earth, I'm not sure, did come up with a plan in which they could share. Um, and, and so it seemed like nodes would be a better way, than only speaking of telecommunications, um, and say emergency vehicles and things like that, where it made sense where the tribes were in proximity to one another to, to, to do it as a partnership. Um, the number one reason was not to save money, but to continue to build the relationship of those tribes in connection with economic development. So I think a uh, lesson learned for Migazi was uh, you can bring an idea, an innovation, but it really is uh, the, the sovereign nation that uh, in the end um, n makes the f decision on whether uh, it wants to go forward. Now the, um, um, the uh, nations, the tribes did say that this was something they were interested in because telecommunications was something that was really needed, but Infrastructure is also needed, and that it would uh, the, it would have been in the millions and millions of dollars, and so it it may happen yet, um, and I think that uh, cooperation uh, is certainly one of the things that is uh, in the works for uh, tribes, but also nonprofits, and some of the uh, organizations like NACTI. Um, was developed just to do that, to get organizations to work uh, with one another on projects. And, and I you know, just personally would have to say that I think the Cultural Corridor is uh, a terrific piece of work. So we had somebody else? I know when I was last at Blacks, as tribes sell garments and jewels, tribes get more and more sophisticated in running their own tribal governments. We were beginning to explore the area of expanding or looking at how we get more nonprofits on the reservation to provide some of the services that we need, um, so it would free us up then to do more of the governance part of tribal government and try to begin to explore and think about how some of the services that 
tribes are providing now um, might be something that we were trying to encourage our band members to step up and start nonprofits. I mean, one area that we struggled uh, was providing like a food shelf. You can't get the food donated, or you can't get the food because you're a tribal government. You have to be a 501c. So we, you know, we were trying to encourage that kind of development on the reservation. And we're all well aware of the funding restrictions. I mean, we built three civilians for our elders. And we sought no outside money because once you do that, then you lose control over who can use those facilities. So I'm just wondering if that might be something that, and I know, and, and I know there's that strong desire to provide those services ourselves to our people, but I think there's going to be a time where tribes will have to kind of look at the new. Um, first, I want to address the tax code issue. Um, although you know it's already kind of codified, it's not as well known. There, the IRS is actually undergoing rulemaking right now. They should it should be published. I would expect within the next uh, quarter. That takes care of the 501c3 issue because it has been confusing, um, where tribes are treated similarly for tax exemption pur uh, purposes. It also um, takes care of the, some of the code regarding um, tribally derived services. We've just all gone through this um, ra rather arduous mechanism where the IRS was tribal trying to tax um, services within reservation communities between tribal um, governments and their people, and we're finally figured they finally figured that out, that that's a part of actually like what we feel we're supposed to do for our citizenry. So that's being taken care of. Um, Fond du Lac has a pretty much different view than of Mille Lacs regarding um, kind of home community nonprofits. Um, our goal with our own revenue is to turn it over in our own economy as many times as possible um, and also do it for the primary benefit of our tribal members. And unless we could absolutely assure that tribal members were being hired um, and that there was preference for that um, and that it matched the values and um, you know, direction of the home community, we're accountable to our home community in a different way than an independent organization. They can kick me out. They cannot reelect me if they don't think I'm doing what I want. And so to kind of remove that away from the purview of the people takes it a step outside their direct control. And um, the other part of it is, is I've not met anybody who's wanted to start a, a nonprofit in our home community that hasn't expected us to pay for it, primarily. Um, and it's just, it, right now with the people that are there, that's just really not gonna happen. Um, if you wanna serve an urban community, um, things like that, you figure, you know, I've got 100,000 acres that I have to watch. Um, in our reservation, the whole rest of the country is available for the nonprofit, but we're gonna home rule within our borders. It's the only last piece we have left. Um, so we're maybe a little bit more funky and a little bit more aggressive in our assertions of sovereignty at Fond du Lac, um, but it's what we have and we're gonna run it to the best of our ability. Another side of um, this conversation um, is nonprofits that have uh, built businesses within the organization, so the 501c3 will own a business and operate it, and then that becomes uh, part of uh, the identity of the organization. Are there any nonprofits in the room that own businesses? Yep. Somebody? Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> Anybody else out there? Well, I'm just gonna ask Bill to briefly, because we've, we've yeah. got two minutes left, to talk about what it means to own a business, and is that an advantage? Absolutely, and, and uh, much like uh, the chairwoman, I'm a huge believer in self-determination. When I got to Little Earth, we were managed by an outside non-Indian property management company. They were great at every other property that they managed. They sucked at Little Earth. <laughs> and I think they, I don't know if they did intentionally, but they lowered the expectation within our community. They managed worse because we're just Indians. 
It took, us, took me six years to convince HUD and Minnesota Housing, my own board of directors, that we need to do this. I could do just as bad as this company. I'm telling you I can. <laughs> and, and, and I won't have to pay them $180,000 to do it. I could do just as bad. With a little effort, hell, I could do better. <laughs> Two years ago, we started our own property management company. Um, it's a subsidiary of our housing corporation. Um, and I'm not sure how many people know this. Little Earth, our, kind of our claim to fame, is we're the only Indian preference housing community in the nation. That's not on a reservation. Uh, you have to be American Indian to live in our community to be a head of household. Uh, so we started this company. Uh, we took, uh, from a financial perspective, uh, we, the, our previous property management company, uh, when I fired them, uh, we were at, sitting at half a million dollar deficit. HUD. The reason HUD finally uh, said yes to me is I said, okay, y'all have sit, sat here and watched this company bankrupt Little Earth, and, and I'll sue you. And I do that every now and then to the government because it's fun. Um, <laughs> so half a million dollar deficit, one year's period with our Indian-owned property management company with kind of our Indian way of leadership, our Indian way of thinking. We moved from a half million dollar deficit to a $60,000 surplus for two years running within our community. Uh, we have put up surplus cash at the end of the year. We've had less than 1% vacancy loss rate. The HUD industry standard is over 5%. Uh, we have 560 families on our waiting list, so I'm, we're trying to figure out how to develop more housing. Um, the value to starting your own business as a nonprofit is the obvious. You uh, control things. It's yours. You, you lead the way you know how to lead. Uh, but it is a diversification of income streams. The organization that we pull in an additional couple hundred thousand dollars a year just from managing our own property. Uh, so every reason to do it. That's terrific. Well, I would <clears throat> like to thank the panel uh, for their words of wisdom.